has a straight edge on it, so it's very easy. And maybe in our world here, there lives a happy little mountain. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Caitlin and I upload a whole bunch of different types of videos on this channel, mainly surrounding true crime videos. I do unsolved mysteries, murders, disappearances, psychological experiment videos, anything along those lines, as well as a little bit of university and lifestyle related videos sprinkled in where I can. So today I'm back with another really, really interesting case. It's technically unsolved, but there's a lot of discussion and um, you'll kind of see why I find it so interesting because there is a huge suspect that has gone kind of, he hasn't been convicted or anything, but everyone is pretty adamant that he is the perpetrator. So today we're going to be talking about the deaths of Jill and Julie Hansen and everything revolving around an accident that happened to their family. So if you want to hear a little bit about this case, then keep on watching and we shall just get started. In 1968, a young couple named Hans and Betty Hansen decided to get married. And then three years later in 1971, they decided to move into a small community called Willow Creek in California. The couple lived in a mobile home, which was often parked next to a warehouse which was kind of home to this logging business that Hans worked in. Hans and Betty had four children in total. Their names were Donnie, Becky, and then two twins named Jill and Julie. So in this video, kind of the main focus is Hans and Betty, of course, and then three out of the four children. So Jill and Julie, and also their half brother, Donnie. So the twins were known as really, really kind girls but they were particularly shy. However, they were quite popular at school because they were known to sort of look out for the new shy and quiet children that were starting at their school. So they were really, really kind of well-liked, non-controversial girls. So the night of focus was November 14th, 1986. Jill and Julie at this point were 16 years old and they were both in their shared bedroom inside the mobile home getting ready for bed. While their half-brother, Donnie, he was 21 years old, he decided that he was going to stay in the Hanson mobile home, which is where he lived full time but because he was visiting family for a little while they let him stay on the sofa for a few nights. At 3am Betty woke suddenly in the middle of the night to the smell of smoke and so she immediately woke up Hans her husband and they both woke up and ran out of their room to see their entire mobile home up in flames. Hans had immediately tried to use the fire extinguisher to put out any of the flames he could however by the point they'd woken up the flames had already spread too far they had grown too large and it was completely out of control. While Hans was fighting the fire, Betty decided to quickly run down the hallway to try and kind of wake everyone up, tell everyone what was going on and try and get them out of the house before the fire reached their bedrooms. The first of the children that she encountered was Donnie and she kind of found him in a really, really strange position. It's kind of quite weird when you think about it. So she found him standing on the edge of the sofa that he was sleeping on, but he was awake. And when she ran in and kind of tried to tell him what had gone on, he was screaming at her in a really, really shrill way, like already worked up, saying things like, get out of here, things like that, really, really shrill and loud. Betty went on record and said that it took her a little, like a quick moment to realise that he wasn't actually shouting at her. She said, I was afraid for him, what was happening, who he was chasing out. So Betty's next port of call then was to quickly run out to the warehouse that they were parked next to where Hans worked because she knew there were a number of fire extinguishers there and she saw Hans completely struggling to put out this fire so she grabbed a few of the fire extinguishers to try and help fight the flames. Hans soon followed her into the warehouse frantically searching for a ladder because the mobile home had two floors and the, the twins' room was on the top floor and because of the fire he couldn't get to it through the stairs so he tried to frantically look for a ladder in hopes of kind of going through their window. As he put the ladder up to the window, he noticed immediately that the entire room had been like covered in flames and they couldn't see anyone, like any sign of either of the girls moving, they couldn't hear them. As he was doing so, he looked down and saw both Donnie and Betty kind of running to and from the warehouse just to try and get anything they could. So like tubs of water, anything they could try and put out the fire. And he said that he called down from the ladder to Donnie saying, Donnie, do you see anyone around, obviously presumably to try and help them? To which Donnie responded, no, there was no one there. 
After 15 minutes, the first responders had arrived at the scene and there had also been a couple of neighbours that had kind of appeared after they'd heard all the commotion to try and help where they could. So not long after the first responders arrived at the mobile home, one of these neighbours shouted that he could see something in this vacant lot kind of across the road from where the mobile home was. The neighbour had noticed a figure that was like hunched over in this in this vacant lot and it actually turned out to be a very very injured and wounded Judy Hansen. So Judy had kind of fallen to the floor a bit that's why he saw this hunched over figure and they found that she had this large open wound in her stomach that left her close to death. When the neighbour came back and told them what they found or like shouted over this is when Donnie just suddenly kind of said that he had managed to get Julie out but not Jill and obviously neither of the parents had at this point heard any sign from either of the girls so Betty straight away began screaming at the firefighters that they needed to find Jill inside the mobile home that was still up in flames. In the meantime Julie was rushed to hospital obviously and the first paramedics kind of assumed that her wound had been caused as part of maybe a, a small explosion that happened during the fire because obviously any sort of cans or anything that had been around the mobile home could have caught fire um, and exploded and kind of left her with this wound. However, it was an extreme shock when doctors kind of looked her over when she'd got into this hospital when they found that she'd actually been shot in the gut with a 12 gauge shotgun. Back at the mobile home, they were struggling to sort of do carry out this search for Jill's body because the, the home was still in flames so their main priority at this point was to put out the fire and then it wasn't until the next morning when emergency services could sort of sift through all the ashes and the remains of the mobile home and this is when they found Jill's body. So she too very very strangely had also been shot and this was listed as her cause of death. Also amongst the ashes of the home they had found three shotgun shells and a five gallon gas can and this is kind of what they assumed had been the murder weapon and also what had been used to set fire to the mobile home. Investigators then searched the warehouse because obviously the home was parked right next to it and this is where they discovered a shotgun and this shotgun was later determined to be the gun that had shot both Julie and Jill Hansen. So one really really strange incident that occurred just two nights after this, this all this happened while police were kind of cornering off. They'd cornered off the whole crime scene including the warehouse and because it had been only two nights before, there were still police officers guarding the warehouse and the crime scene. So Donnie was caught trying to break into the warehouse while there were all these kind of officers patrolling. So when he was caught, Donnie claimed that he was only doing so because he thought that the family dog was still in the warehouse and that he came to get the dog. However, the dog had been sent straight over to the neighbor's house, kind of one of the first things that happened while everything was going on because obviously they didn't want it to get hurt or anything. and. People claimed that Donnie was aware of this, so this can't have been the real reason that he had broken into the warehouse. A number of people have chosen to believe that his real reason for breaking into the warehouse that night was because he knew that the shotgun, the murder weapon, was in there uh, because he'd placed it in there and so he tried to break in that night in hopes of hiding it. This became a huge red flag, so Donnie was obviously already a suspect, but it made him seem so guilty like there was some sort of involvement that he hadn't been mentioning to the investigators and this only seemed worse when investigators searched his car they found shotgun shells that matched the bullets used to shoot both the twins and also they found that Donnie had also borrowed this shotgun he had been the one that had bought the shotgun to the warehouse he had borrowed it from a friend just a few days before the incident the credit card statement showed that he had purchased the shells just the night before the shooting and he'd also purchased the five gallon gas can two nights before the shooting. So this five gallons of gas that was found at the scene, so the container, the container matched the one used when he had bought this five gallons of gas, so in likelihood it's the same container of gas basically. Around two weeks after the fire, Julie managed to recover just enough to sort of start remembering things that had happened that night and began sort of telling investigators what she could remember. So at first she couldn't remember much, she said she could remember being shot but not by who and she said she could remember having to climb over her sister who had already been shot to try and get out of the house and she also said that she remembered running away from the mobile home and then collapsing in the vacant lot. Upon further questioning she said that her memories started becoming more clearer as she began to feel better and so she ultimately actually gave a statement where she said that she recalled seeing Donnie's face in the flash of the shotgun. So this statement seemed to completely implicate Donnie, however it was completely different to a statement that she had given the doctors who were in charge of her care, so there is no way of sort of knowing just how credible this was. 
On December 2nd, Donnie turned up voluntarily to the local police station just to sort of answer some more questions to see if he could give any more details about what had happened to that night. And at this point, he still maintained his innocence as having nothing to do with what happened. He appeared to be able to provide kind of rational, calm explanations for everything that seemed to implicate him. Um, so he seemed really, really kind of well thought out. He claimed that he was aware that the shotgun would have made him seem guilty and that's why he panicked and hid it in the warehouse because he didn't want them to get the wrong idea. However, despite him seeming so calm and collected, he actually failed two polygraph tests, which obviously implicates him even more. And investigators believed they had enough to arrest Donnie to implicate him completely, despite a lot of the evidence being circumstantial. And Donnie was soon charged with arson and murder. However, the case does not end here. Sadly, on December 19th, 1987, Julie Hansen, while in hospital, died as a result of a complete accident. So an air bubble had entered her bloodstream through her IV tube, which was at no one's fault. It was no one's fault whatsoever, um, which ultimately caused her heart to stop beating and she died sadly. So due to the timing of her death, her testimony implicating Donnie as the shooter could not be used in court in Donnie's trial because she hadn't had time to be cross-examined by the defence attorneys working on Donnie's case before she died. So because she had only managed to give her testimony to one side of the prosecutor basically, she, it was deemed as inadmissible because she hadn't been cross-examined. And as they had lost their main witness in this trial, the prosecutors had a very, very difficult time trying to prove their case. So Donnie's trial began in April of 1988 and the prosecuting side had kind of claimed that they were quite confident still with the case that they had managed to put together despite losing their key witness. They requested that Donnie face the death penalty because not only had he purchased the murder weapon and brought ammunition and then brought it to the scene, but he also actively hid it after the crime and also lied about it. However, the trial did not go kind of as straightforward as the prosecutors had hoped because the defence side managed to bring in two witnesses uh, who were there at the night and they claimed that they had both seen two unknown men hovering around the mobile home the night of the fire. So the theory from the defence attorneys followed the lines that at around 3am these two unknown men, these perpetrators, stumbled across Donnie's gun and the gas can and knowing that they couldn't be implicated, they couldn't be linked back because these were found inside the home, they decided to just carry out this seemingly random attack. So they set fire to the home, they shot the two girls because they had borne witness to them and yeah, they didn't really provide any reason for why these two unknown men would carry out a crime, but this was the theory that the defence had created. The main argument I would say that was kind of proposed during the trial from the prosecutor's side was why would these two men shoot Jill and Julie who would be no more witness than Donnie would. So they didn't shoot Donnie and Donnie was already awake. So there's kind of that big question mark of how reliable that is. And it also doesn't really make a very compelling explanation uh, for why these men would randomly attack this family for no reason. And then if they had planned the attack, they obviously most likely would have brought their own weapons because they wouldn't have assumed that there would be weapons at the crime scene. Despite these holes in the theory, the trial actually ended with a surprise twist and the jury found Donnie as not guilty. Following his trial, Donnie moved away. He changed his name legally because he didn't want to be linked whatsoever to the crime. However, he has since made recent claims of kind of accounts of that night that are completely different to the ones that he gave in the trial that ultimately proved him as not guilty. He has since gone on record saying that the real reason he moved the gun that night, so he admitted to lying about why he moved the gun, and the real reason that he had moved the gun was because he was afraid of someone stealing it. He wouldn't have any reason to think this, and also he had already moved the gun after the fire had already started burning in the home, so that is just so strange to me. During the trial, his attorney claimed that Donnie had woken up at the sound of gunshots, and this is why he was able to get Julie out of the home in time before she was killed. However, he has since claimed that he had never heard any shots. So despite him being formally acquitted in his trial, Donnie is still the main suspect in this crime, but because he was acquitted, he can't be taken to trial again. His own mother is even adamant that he had something to do with the crime. She said that he had kind of intended this attack because he wanted to claim the life insurance policy payout that he would have thought the family would have received after losing all the family members in an accident. And this theory in particular is really, really widely supported, not only by his own family, but also law enforcement officials. A lot of them have gone on record saying they can't really do anything about it, but a lot of them believe this is the true event. And Hans and Betty Hansen 
do not stay in contact with Donny. They haven't spoken to him since his trial and they're likely to sort of never really contact him ever again because they also believe he is the perpetrator. So that is everything I have to talk about today. Um, it's absolutely fascinating case. Personally, you guys can maybe argue with me, but I don't see, I don't have any reason to believe that there was anyone else guilty of this except for Donny. Whether there was someone else potentially involved and Donny had kind of helped them, I don't know, but I do think in some aspects, whether or not he, sh he was the one that shot the girls or started the fire, I think he is guilty in some way. And yeah, you guys can disagree with me, but let me know down below your thoughts because this is heartbreaking case that these poor girls lost their lives that day. Um, but it's really, really fascinating to sort of hear discussions on this. So yes, let me know down below. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you guys have found this interesting and I'll see you guys tomorrow for another installment of my true crime week. Thanks for watching. Bye.